A racing championship dreamt up by a wealthy shake, a car designed to look good rather than have pure performance, and 10 years of thrilling racing in three different series, and David Hasselhoff. This is the rather unlikely story of the Lola B0552, better known as the A1 Grand Prix car. Huntingdon, England in early 2004. The management of racing car constructor Lola Cars were waiting nervously in their office for somebody who claimed to be a member of Dubai's royal family. He apparently wanted to place what would be the largest ever order of modern racing cars ever made. The whole thing seemed like a complete scam. It was surely too good to be true. The visit from the Dubai royal family member though was the real deal. It was Sheikh Maktoum Hasha Maktoum Al Maktoum, and it's fair to say that he was a demanding client. Around a year earlier, he'd announced a concept for a new single-seater racing championship based in Dubai at the newly completed Autodrome. It was to be called Arabia One. The show car at the launch appeared to be the old Lola Formula 3000 car, with a Langford performance engine. The idea of the new championship was a World Cup of Nations, pitting countries against each other rather than manufacturers or private teams. The drivers, sponsors and the team management would all have to come from the represented nation. Additionally, the series planned to target nations which were not major centres of motorsport already, and that was a canny idea, opening up new markets for the sport and securing the TV rights early on. Of course, traditional nations were not discouraged, they just weren't the main objective. Exactly why Sheikh Maktoum didn't want to use the obsolete Lola shown off at the Arabia One launch is not entirely clear, but a year later he was at Lola's door and the series was now called A1 Grand Prix. It turned out that he had a very clear vision of what the car should look like and started to sketch it out on a piece of paper in that very first meeting while telling the Lola engineers present that he wanted the car to look like a shark. After some fairly long and gentle discussions, Maktoum and the staff at Lola agreed on a basic but perhaps a bit more finessed initial sketch of what the car should look like. Then Lola's engineers had to go and design a working car around that one sketch. In reality, the only way to deliver the car in time with just eight weeks until the car was due to be shown off in public for the first time was for Lola to use an existing design and adapt it. Work was already well underway on an updated version of the Lola B0250 chassis, which was then the current F3000 car, the series that later got replaced by GP2. That updated car would go on to become the Lola Formula Nippon chassis, which we will get back to. Basing the new A1 GP car on the old F3000 car gave Lola a very effective basis for the new car. The carbon fibre chassis would remain largely unchanged structurally from either the F3000 or future Formula Nippon car beyond a few minor styling points, particularly at the front end of the car. It would retain the pushrod actuated inboard mounted dampers front and rear, the fully stressed engine installation would be connected to Lola's six-speed sequential transmission, again based on the same unit used in F3000 so reliably. However, the very conventional and perhaps even staid looks of the BO250 did not really meet the Shake's satisfaction. Indeed, the Shake was very hands-on from that very first sketch all the way through the design process with engineers Julian Cooper and Julian Soul of Lola. Ultimately, the car was fitted with a new, very stylistic shroud on the roll hood. The front and rear wings were equally styled and Lola had to use its in-house CFD and wind tunnel capacity to make sure that the Shake's dream, that sketch, actually really worked on track. The first version of the design didn't actually perform that well aerodynamically, but development work in the 50% scale wind tunnel at Lola saw downforce increase substantially and the car become a bit more stable. But as this was a one-make car, the emphasis was on making that car as stable as possible, not only because it was being driven by seasoned drivers in the new series, but also rookies coming from nations that didn't have a big motorsport history. Safety was also a key consideration for Lola, as Al Maktoum pointed out that he would be the first person to drive the new car, and he would also demonstrate it on public roads in Dubai. If the car wasn't safe, Lola would lose its biggest client rather abruptly and rather dramatically. So crash testing was conducted at the Cranfield Impact Centre. The engine used in the car came from Lola's F3000 collaboration 
accelerators Zytec. And although the normally aspirated V8 engine designed for the A1 Grand Prix car was presented as an all new unit, in reality it was nothing of the sort. The ZA348 as it was officially known was largely based on Zytec's existing ZG348 sports car engine, which had made its debut all the way back in 2003, which in itself had its roots in the 4 litre ZB408 V8 engine used in the panel's LMP07. Although the 3.4 litre version of this engine only had 15 to 20% of the components of that larger unit. For Zytec, the original 3.4 litre engine was quite innovative in the way it was designed as it used 3D CAD for the first time. In fact, it's believed that this is one of the very first pure racing engines to be totally designed in 3D CAD. Don't tell the F1 teams. In A1 GP form, the engine had to be tuned along with the exhaust to have a distinctive and loud crackle off the throttle. This was another demand of the shake, and it was a good one. The sound of the A1 GP cars was great. The final ZA348 engine was a 3.4 litre normally aspirated V8 capable of 550 brake horsepower. It had a 90 degree cylinder bank angle and had sand cast aluminium heads and crankcase. The overall engine weight was 120 kilograms. Maktoum originally ordered 30 engines from Zytec, a number which was significantly increased after demand from teams wanting to join his new championship, and that engine Engine demand went up to 58 engines, giving the English company a major manufacturing job. Lola was also asked to make no less than 50 A1 GP chassis, the largest order of modern racing cars anyone had ever made at that point. The tyres on the car were, in short, huge, especially at the rear. Again, this was a specific request of the Sheikh, who just wanted them to be bigger because it looked cool, not for any dynamic reason. And Cooper Avon, the tyre manufacturer, actually had to come up with special manufacturing manufacturing techniques for a tyre that big. Maktoum was the first person to drive the initial test car and he promptly spun it. Later on he managed to complete some laps of the Snetterton circuit but he sensibly handed over to Lola's official test driver Ralph Furman to carry on the development work. A look back at the final car revealed something quite different to the original Lola F3000 design. The bodywork was indeed striking with a much more curved nose complete with wide curved front wing supports and a twin element front wing with utter huge end plates. Behind the front wing there were two mandatory camera housings, in fact the whole car had lots of these camera housings dotted all over it. You can see two more just alongside the cockpit. This was very much a television sport. The roll hoop shape was dramatic and I think it was designed to look a little bit Arabian in aesthetic terms. The size of the inlet duct actually looks a lot bigger than it actually was. When you compare these two pictures you can see how much smaller the aperture and the actual roll hoop really is in reality. It was just well disguised on most cars underneath that bonded on composite structure. On the side pod there were huge double deck aerodynamic elements at the rear with the upper part having a winglet on it complete with end plates. It was almost vertical and I would have said it must have created a huge amount of drag but it sat right in front of those enormous rear tyres so probably it didn't really matter. The side pod ducts were very much made to look a certain way that I want it to look like a shark aesthetic and it wasn't done for aerodynamic reasons. I do think it looked cool though. From the side, this is Nico Hulkenberg's season 2 Germany car just after winning the title by the way, you can see the cooling gills on the bodywork and that very large double element flick up on the back of the side pod. I'm not sure how much those cooling gills were really needed in terms of cooling and how much they were just there to make the car look a bit like a shark. The rear wing end plate was very distinctive and very much styled by the shake and it fed into the inner end plates of those side pod flick ups. Note the dorsal fin on the car as well, another initial part of the shake sketch. Here's a look from behind where you can see those cooling slits on the side pods and the way the rear wing meets the inner end plates of those flick hubs. All cars had double wishbone suspension all round with pushrod actuated dampers. Here's a look at the front suspension and the front brakes which used ventilated steel discs. The red tape on the inlet duct is a little surprising as this picture was taken on a very hot day at Silverstone. That test session at Silverstone was really quite interesting as we used it to test out thermal imaging to take tyre temperatures and brake temperatures on the dams run cars. We were also able to get usable temperature data from every car in the pits without teams knowing. I think this was the first time that such kit had been used in motorsport but it 
it then became quite commonplace. With the bodywork removed, it's clear to see the inboard suspension layout with the twin pushrod actuated spring and damper units from Olin's. This picture here is from the later Lola B0651 Formula Nippon car at its first test. You can see the front suspension layout is essentially the same. Here's a look at the rear end of the car, showing the inboard rear suspension mounting on top of the transmission casing, as well as the Zytec V8 installation. What might have seen unlikely at first rapidly started to look like a great success. A1GP would pioneer the Winter Series concept, looking to avoid clashes with Formula One and other European championships by starting its season in September 2005 and ending it in March the following year. 25 teams entered in the inaugural season and the caliber of driver was extremely high, with young talent mixing with drivers who were active or recently retired from Formula One, as well as international sports car racing. The list of drivers in that first season reads like a who's who of international motor racing. Names like PK, Fittipaldi, Lauda, Verstappen. No, not that one, his dad, Jos. In fact, in that first season, 10 drivers who had raced or would race in Formula One took part. At the end of the season, the French entry proved to be somewhat dominant, with Alexander Primat and Nicolas Lapierre winning most of the races. Overall, though, the first season could be deemed to be a huge success, even though there were some huge crashes. It was a similar story in the second season with 24 nations on the grid, and this time, as I mentioned, Germany were crowned champions with Nico Hülkenberg doing most of the driving and most of the winning. The third and final season for the Lola in A1 Grand Prix was again a very strong one. Although only 22 teams lined up, Switzerland won the title with Neil Yarny driving in every single race. For the fourth season though, A1 GP's management, which notably no longer included Sheikh Maktoum, wanted to switch to a new car. This car would have a Ferrari Ferrari engine and some technical support from the Italian company. The Lolas, which were still perfectly good racing cars, were then retired. A1 GP though did have plans for the Lolas to use them in a new series called A2. There was already an A3 series in South Africa, or at least there had been at one point, which used the modified Formula Volkswagen car designed to look a little bit like the A1 GP car. A2 was to provide the bridge between A3 and A1. This was especially important as there were a number of nations which wanted to enter the A1 GP championship, but they didn't have enough drivers or any drivers with enough experience or the right license to take part. However, the A1 GP championship collapsed financially after its fifth season. Some people suggested that the second generation Ferrari powered car was partly to blame for this, as it was a lot more expensive to run than the Lola. Perhaps we'll get back to this, but first, more of this. <laughs> The Lolas then were clearly not done racing. In 2009, a number of them were used in the Euro Series 3000 Championship, running alongside some old Lola F3000 cars. Contesting this series, which in 2010 became Auto GP, the A1 GP Lolas received some modifications. A new front wing was fitted, and the side pod aerodynamic elements were simplified with the upper element removed completely, and finally a toned down version of the rear wing was fitted with more conventional end plates. The 3.4 litre to V8 though, and its very distinctive sound was retained. Notably, the series ran on Michelin tyres with a narrower rear wheel used. The inaugural Auto GP Championship was won by Roman Grosjean, who'd lost his drive at the Renault F1 team the previous season. Although the series didn't have as many cars on the grid as A1 GP did when it ran the Lolas, the field was pretty healthy and remained so for the next couple of seasons. For the 2013 season, the Auto GP cars would get another extremely substantial update. By this point though, Lola had collapsed financially, it had gone bankrupt and essentially no longer existed. So championship organisers, Coloni, yes, that Coloni, announced that the car's development programme would be headed by former F1 designer Enrique Scalabroni. Oh, and he only had six weeks to redesign the car and manufacture a prototype. The new look Auto GP cars retained the mechanical core of the car, including the chassis, but to look at them, it would be hard to tell that they were ever A1 Grand Prix cars. The flared roll hoops were gone, with an additional cooling duct opened up behind the main roll hoop. In the launch image from Auto GP, the car featured a double element front wing, but in testing a triple element upper flap was used. The front and rear wings were quite conventional, and the bridge section used on the post A1 GP version of the Auto GP car was also removed, and new end plates were installed. The side pods had been completely redesigned, with the addition of a vertical aerodynamic element near the leading edge coming up off the floor, and there was the complete deletion of the characteristic gills on the side pod and the flick-ups at the rear of the side pod. The inlet 
product so characteristic of the A1 Grand Prix car was completely changed. In fact overall the revised car looked more like a modernised F3000 car and essentially that's what it was and it was about 1.5 seconds a lap faster than the old A1 GP version. But now things get a little bit bizarre. With AutoGP racing its modified A1 GP Lolas in 2013, by 2014 the size of the grid was dropping quite significantly. The series peaked at 17 cars and some people sort of wondered what the point of the AutoGP championship was. It clearly wasn't quite like GP2 as a pure feeder series as in 2014 two former Formula 1 drivers contested rounds of the championship so it was sort of like a European equivalent of Super Formula. But with that uncertainty aside this is where things get really really odd. Another new series started up called Formula Acceleration 1 or FA1 and it was also to use the A1 GP Lolas and well, here's one of the official promotion videos for it. I can't explain it. Come join me, David Hasselhoff, and the Acceleration Tour, where we bring racing to music. We celebrate the 80s and 90s with Rick Astley, Two Unlimited, Venga Boys, 24-7, and the hottest cars in the world. See us live. As I mentioned, this new championship would use Lola A1 GP cars, but these cars would run in what was almost the old Auto GP configuration with the original Auto GP front wing and end plates and the single level side pod flicks returned. But it would retain the A1 GP rear wing, the A1 GP side pods, and the A1 GP very distinctive roll hoop ducts. The series would also follow an A1 GP nation versus nation format. Well, at least that was the theory. We'll come back to that. The series, as the Hoff mentioned, was part of a touring festival of motorsport and 80s and 90s music and dance music and motorcycle racing. And as you've seen, David Hasselhoff. I, I really don't know how to not make this sound like satire. Anyway, the Nations Cup concept started to fall apart a bit, well, right away. The Team China entry, for example, used drivers from Spain, the Netherlands, Portugal and France. The French entry used a Belgian driver for most of the season and one Italian, and once it actually had a French driver, and this pattern went on. However, the teams representing Slovakia, Germany, Italy and the Netherlands, and indeed Mexico and Spain, did all sort of get it right most of the time. Bizarrely though, at the fifth and final round of the championship, a British driver drove one of the Team Spain cars and a Spaniard drove the British entry. It's fair to say then that the FA1 series was not only a bit wild but it was just generally a big confusion and at the end of the 2014 season Sensibility took over and it announced it was merging with AutoGP but then the merger never quite happened and AutoGP just continued while FA1 didn't. Despite the large number of raceable XA1 GP Lolas around, the grid numbers sharply dropped in AutoGP. At the opening round of the 2015 AutoGP season, only nine cars showed up. And at the second race meeting of the year at Silverstone, there were only seven cars. And at that point, the season was cancelled. In 2016, AutoGP was merged into Boss GP and those Lolas became a rare sight and have been ever since. Even though it was almost unrecognisable in its final form, the Lola B0552 is really quite a remarkable machine, having been used as the basis of three entirely separate championships in a 10 year racing career where it outlasted the company which built it and its own design. If you've enjoyed this constantly rebuilt story of European and world single seater racing, then don't forget to hit like and subscribe and I'll see you soon somewhere in the pits. I can't promise the Hoff will be there though.